Hello, this is Liz and Jamie, and it's podcast 016 of the Casting Off series. And today's date is, Jamie? It's the day before a very special birthday. Yes, my birthday tomorrow. Woohoo! May the 4th be with you. So that means it's the 3rd today. It is indeed. And we've got quite a subject to discuss today, haven't we? We have. It's a big one. Yeah. Uh, it's quite a serious one. Yes. And I think it's something that is going to be of interest to, obviously, to all sailors and cruisers out there. But I think also it'd be interesting to talk through some of these ideas to non-sailors as well. Maybe dispel some fears, rumours and thoughts and perhaps uh, bring to the fore some other thoughts that they may not have considered. Yes, so we're talking about the biggest fears you have as a sailor, but also we're going to highlight that with our five worst experiences, aren't we? Hello, I'm Liz. And I'm Jamie. Welcome to Follow the Boat, in which we discuss what it's really like to give it all up to live on a boat. And go travelling around the world. We've been doing it since 2006 and we're still at it. Each week we talk about our latest YouTube videos. And about boats, sailing, travel or anything else which floats into our heads. And if you leave a comment we like, we'll give you an answer and a name check. Peace Peace and and fair fair winds. winds. So just to go back to the, the very end of episode 299, it shows us at night in an anchorage with huge winds going on outside and big waves. It looks like we're sailing. In fact, we are at anchor. And I think we did explain that we were with three other boats, two of which dragged. Yes, that's right. One ended up in a pretty horrible situation. Do we want to talk about that now? Well, we'll just very quickly talk about the fact that uh, we... Because this big squall came through, it created a really bad sea state. And so the boat's doing this, and this is one of the problems when you're at anchor, is that the boat ends up, if you're lucky, it will bounce backwards and forwards. Yeah, so when you say doing this, you need to explain, because remember our podcasters can't hear, see what you're doing. Yes, hobby horsing, I call it. So it's tipping forwards and backwards. And of course, this is putting pressure on the anchor. Yeah. And uh, that's always a concern because yes. so many things could go wrong. I went up the front at one stage because we were worried that we were gonna, the anchor was going to jump out to check the snubber. And the snubber was fine, but we were coming, I would say, a metre and a half out of the water at the front at yeah. least. Yeah, we had breaking waves coming yeah. over the boat. And as I've said in the past, breaking waves at sea when you're sailing is fine. But when you're at anchor, it's not a nice situation to no. be in. So... This whole situation got me thinking about some of the terrible situations we've been in at sea. Mm. And it got me thinking about worst things that happen at sea, that classic expression. Mm. And I think for a lot of non-sailors, it probably conjures up ideas of uh, hitting rocks and surfing down five metre waves and, uh, you know, just generally getting yourself into bad situations at sea. But I realise, of course, that a lot of the situations we've been in have been quite close to land and at anchor. Yes, there was only one that happened at sea, which we'll get on to. So we're going to talk about the the five worst, Mm. um, and all based on what what happened then. How are you going? How are you going to do this? Can you start now with the with the five worst? So I was going to give my top five worst situations that we have been in. Yes. Okay. And, of course, this does come into line with what a lot of people said. We did a poll on our YouTube community page. Yes. We got over 400 votes. Yes. And uh, lots of comments as well. So we'll refer to some of those comments. I'll just very quickly say the results, shall I? So it was the community page, also Facebook, also Patreon, FTB Mates, and all those. So I put them all together. But the four things that we put out as suggestions, and then we had an other option, were man overboard, fire, hitting a container, and lightning. Man overboard came first, fire came second, hitting a container third, lightning fourth. And then there were a lot of votes for other. Okay, so all great you know, yes. results. But I think one thing that came up, and a lot of people mentioned this, is the theme of mitigation. Yes. And I think we have to think about these things when we consider the bad things that can happen on a boat. Yep. Because mitigation comes into play in avoiding a lot of these situations. And I think the top five that I'm going to refer to kind of fall outside of that. They are situations in which you don't have control over. Right, so for, for you, because I hasten to add, this is your top five, mm-hmm. 
Um, I may differ, we will find out because we've had a very brief chat about this, so I've got my little list here. So this is what's actually happened to us, it's not what we fear most, it's the things that have actually happened to us. Well, they, they kind of tie in with each other. Fortunately, I think the things we fear the most haven't happened to us, mm -hmm. touch wood. Uh, but number five is the anchor dragging. Yeah. And I think it's important to get this one in here because you, you're anchoring every day or almost every single day. So it's very relevant to your day-to-day -day, uh, living on board the boat. Mm -hmm. And I think this is why it's important to, to highlight this. Mm -hmm. Now we had that terrible situation in episode 299. Well, there was another situation which was even worse, which we've yet to document in our uh, weekly vlog. Yes, but, and of course anchor dragging doesn't mean just your anchor dragging, well, it's what's going on around you and watching other boats and we've been in worse situations with other boats dragging towards us I think than actually dragging ourselves. The worst time I remember when we dragged was in Kudat when we had sustained gale for about two or three days of 35 plus knots. That was pretty nasty. We had to do two nights at anchor watch. There was, it was three nights. And the, yeah. anchor dra the anchor dragged because we anchored uh, outside a town which was just full of rubbish. And yeah, when exactly. eventually we pulled up the anchor, it had t-shirts, jeans, uh, plastic bags. Do you remember? We yes. pulled up about five t-shirts and it was basically just full of crap. Yes. It had no chance of holding there. Uh, then, as I say, recently uh, we had this situation where we had two fishing boats bearing down on us. Yeah. And if you remember, in our very first summer of owning Esper in Turkey, we anchored in a place called Dacha. And I don't know if you remember oh, this. Oh, I do, yeah. And this was our first experience of dragging anchors. And this beautiful Trondil, which is a classic Aegean fishing boat, mm. beautiful wooden open plan boat, double ender, came and anchored right in front of us. Yeah, very close. And uh, I shouted out to the guy and I said, hey, I think you're anchored too close. He completely ignored me. He mm. dumped his hook. He didn't even back up onto his anchor, mm. got in his dinghy, went ashore. And of course, in uh, that area of the Aegean, you have the, uh, the Meltemi, yeah. the northerly winds that come down. So sure enough, midday, those winds kicked in. Oh, we were getting 30 knots every day yeah. off the Turkish coast. Yeah. And what happened? His well, boat dragged. Yeah, he, he dragged. He dragged so badly that I remember standing at the front of Esper and holding the front of his boat. We were mm. literally holding it off, weren't we? We were fending him, fending yeah. this boat off as it dragged down alongside yeah. our boat. Wooden, wooden prow right over our boat and yeah. holding it. God. That was in our first summer. Yeah. Uh, and that, that's why I am so twitchy about anchoring next to, close to other people. Yeah. And I think the lesson learned there really was, well, um, if... You're in that situation and the person who's anchored like that yeah. and has left the boat, we should have just weighed anchor and anchored somewhere else. Right, and now that is something we've learned and that is something that we do. Uh, we did it in the Anambas about three years ago when we had one of, one of those uh, fishing platforms in a very bad squall. I mean, you could see just the front of the boat. But we knew that it was. We could see that it was coming towards us, and then the boat, then the the weather got really, really bad. And we said, right, we're out of here. Now it was difficult because we were in a quite a narrow area with a reef all the way around. But you had the track that we came in on, and because we couldn't see anything, all we could do was follow that track out. Mm. But he did drag because when when it all cleared, that fishing platform was where we'd been anchored. And if we hadn't moved, we'd have been bashed. Yeah, well, that's the thing. What would have happened? So these are not necessarily a dragging anchor is not necessarily life threatening. No, but it is something that happens regularly. We've seen what happens to boats when they cross their chains, yeah. and that is a situation you do not want to be in. Mm. So yeah, it's I put that in there because it's just something that happens so frequently, and uh, it's a stressful situation. The one that happened a couple of weeks ago in uh, Tolly Tolly was one of the most scary moments of my life, um, but also, weirdly, ad an adrenaline rush. Mm. And after it happened, I won't talk about any detail because it's presumably we're gonna put it on one of our episodes, but after it happened, I said to you that I felt as though I was in like a James Bond movie with a countdown going on. <laughs> and I could see this clock getting down. And I was thinking, normally in James Bond, it gets to one and then it doesn't go off the bomb. but this is real life, is it really going to go off or not? And it did get to one in to that one. situation. Yeah, it did. <gasps> Two fishing boats dragging either side of us 
One so close you could have stepped off our boat onto it. That's how close Coming that situation. Straight at us. Yeah. Big, huge boat. Horrible. Now Colin Mills says, worst thing for me so far was dragging anchor in Dale Bay in South Wales in 50 knots of wind with breaking surf in the channel. Amidst howling winds, the anchor alarm went off and I spent the next two hours wrestling to recover the anchor, keep the boat off the rocks and to secure it. To this day, my anchor alarm sends me into an immediate panic. I was on the boat alone. Colin, understand exactly how you yes. feel. And this is, if you talk to cruisers, probably one of the most common fears we all have. No matter how often we anchor, we all have this fear that something is going to happen. So you really do have to be ready. I mean, uh, there were quite a few examples. Yes. No Dog Runner, uh, they were in a situation where they anchored and then they, um, they accidentally floated around a buoy which wrapped around their prop yeah. and they ended up in a situation where the boat started filling up with water and the coast guard had to be called out I mean, again horrible situation mm. and stephen february says worst fear ending up on rocks with small crew on board and he was coming into anchor off a reef between two islands where there was a strong current uh, he let 20 metres of chain out, but he lost his markers. Yes, and it went right to the bitter end, didn't it? I yeah. read that one. Yes, yeah, so there he is standing there with yeah. the chain in one hand, yeah. the snubber in the other hand, yeah. and he eventually managed to get the snubber on. Remember, the snubber is that hook which you hook over the chain, and it's got a, a line uh, you know, which you attach to a cleat. And this well, creates... it's a spring, basically. He doesn't yeah. always have to have a hook. You can just do it with a, with a knot, but it's the spring that holds the chain. He got the chain back on. But then something else happened, he got back to the cockpit and what had happened? Well, he'd, he'd left the engine running yeah. and by the time he'd got the snubber on the anchor, he got back to the cockpit to find his engine had stopped running. And what had happened was the painter, which is the line that connects to your dinghy, yeah. had wrapped around the prop yeah. because he was towing his dinghy. Yeah. And normally what happens is when you get something wrapped around the prop, it kills the engine. Yes. Dead. Yes. yes, as we know, happened recently to us. It did. <laughs> Now, um, this is a perfect example, yeah. I have to say, of why we never tow yes. the dinghy. And also, when we're at anchor, we hoist the dinghy because we've been in situations with just the, uh, the dinghy hanging off the back of the boat and that painter, which isn't a floating line, falls and wraps around our auxiliary rudder. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's a uh, yeah, good example of why you should never tow your dinghy. Yeah. I and mean, he was there on his own, so he didn't, ha with us, one of us would have been back at the engine and, and would have perhaps um, been able to be motoring while the other one was at the front, pissing around with the chain. What he does say is he was lucky he got the chain back onto the windlass and he got the anchor to set, because if he hadn't, he'd have had no engine and no anchor. And that would have been the end of his boat. And this, in this particular situation, yeah. he's in a narrow channel yeah. and he would have been on rocks very, very quickly. Yeah. So to all of those who didn't think about anchors, it really needs to be up on that list. It needs to be really at the forefront of your mind when you're cruising. Yeah. And I think I've said many times, the worst obstructions and hazards to uh, this cruising life are around the coast, yeah. reefs, rocks, other boats. Mm. You know, you're in, in these situations far more frequently than you are out in the open sea where you're less likely to hit something. Okay, number four, uh, I think you've got two quotes from Doug Tiffany and Melinda Taylor, haven't you? And it is being run down by a container ship. This happened to us when we were crossing in the South China Sea between Tiamen in Malaysia and the Anambas Islands. Yeah. It's actually a very busy shipping channel because it connects Singapore to China. So you have a lot of uh, commercial traffic coming up and down this this. I suppose the traffic corridor is probably 50 miles wide. Yeah. So for 50 miles, you're having to cross traffic that's going north to south while you go east to west. And it always seems to be at night. Yes. <laughs> yeah, well, there's no avoiding that uh, because the traffic is so wide. Mm. And this one particular incident was when I had even radioed through to this, I think it was a, it was a big ferry, I can't remember. And I think it was commercial. I think it was a container. A container. You, yeah. And I'd radioed through to him and I said, do you see us? Mm. And he replied and said, yes, I do. Mm. And I said, would you mind just keeping us to starboard or whatever the situation was? I didn't think anything more of it until five minutes later when I turned round, looked behind the boat and I could see both port and starboard light 
two, three hundred metres away from us. Straight at us, oh. high up in, they were, it's a huge boat, it's a huge bloody boat. And I have that in my nightmares, I can see it right now. Yep, I can picture it so clearly. He couldn't see us, he'd, he'd identified another boat as us. Do, is that what happened? I think he just lied. Right. There were no other boats around, apart from other commercial traffic. Yeah. So who knows, but, and in that situation, what can you do? Because you can only travel at five knots, six knots, seven yeah. knots. Yeah. He's doing 15 knots. Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely terrifying. Did he turn away quickly? Did he see us? I can't remember. I don't, I think I was too busy filling my pants. It was terrifying. And the, the thing that terrifies me about container ships, and we do get um, crew and skippers on container ships, or large commercial ships commenting, and they all say, without fail, we do not see you. Yep. We don't see you. You have to contact us. Uh, if you've got radar, if you've got AIS, you are not invincible. Yep. Quite often they can't see your AIS, or there's no one looking at it, or you know, there's, no, there's no one up there on the bridge. It's all done. It's all done remotely. They yeah. don't have to monitor 1.6 anymore, remember? That's not an obligation they have to adhere to. And as you say, I think once they set their autopilot, they, they don't necessarily always have someone on watch. And even if they did, which I'm sure they probably are supposed to, if you've got any kind of movement in the water, a little yacht mm. is going to disappear behind a wave mm. quite easily. And as you say, you're just Blinkly not visible. Yeah. So I think they do have to monitor 1.6. I, I, I can't believe that they can't. They have to be able to monitor. No, with, with the uh, introduction of DSC, right. uh, they do not have to monitor 1.6. Right, so you need to explain what DSC is because you've used that a few times. DSC is digital selective calling. And so any VHF nowadays will have DSC fitted as a standard. And it allows you to uh, make selective calls to specific uh, vessels out there if you have their MMSI number. Which you get from the ASR. AIS, AIS yes. signal. So yep. if you haven't got AIS, you can't do this. Uh, that, that's correct. Mm. Yeah. Um, but it is a way of not clogging up 1.6 and mm. being able to talk directly to a, to a ship. But there are other features as well, like man overboard. And, and, and it means that if they're not monitoring 1.6, they will get a loud beep, which is somebody calling them. Correct. Yeah. yeah. So that's what we use when we need to get hold of them. See, sometimes I'm on watch and I'm looking at... Uh, I'm looking at the screen and I'm seeing various AIS signals, radar's another one, but just AIS and I can see where they're going and it says where they're going and I think, supposing they suddenly decided to make a sharp left or a sharp right and they haven't seen us, you can't just assume they're going to carry on in the way that they are showing because they might see an obstacle, something may happen to them, something may go wrong with their autopilot, their steering, anything could go wrong with them just as it can with us. So you're very, very vulnerable as a small boat in shipping lanes. And for me, that is number one on my list of fears. Yep. So Melinda Taylor said yeah. nearly being hit by a huge fishing boat in the Singapore Straits. She said the bastards must have been doing it deliberately as each time we turned off, so did they. She said it's the first time she's ever needed to give a crew uh, a Valium. Uh, now we know we know Melinda, lovely yeah. lady, very knowledgeable, experienced sa sailor. Yeah. Shall I read Doug's? Well, I was just oh, I, all I wanted to say was that we have been in situations where fishing boats have been toying with mm. us. Mm. I remember off Sri Lanka this happening, and it is very scary mm. when you've got and these fishing boats can go a lot faster than you can when they push their engines. And they don't give a shit about hitting you because they. <laughs> They're going to give you the damage, not the other way around. Yeah. Yes, it, uh, they are very scary. I don't know whether it's deliberate. I remember the only deliberate thing I can remember is through, um, I think it was the Mentawis. We were trying to get through to something and we we're going through a narrow passage. I think it was a passenger ship and it would not have anything to do with this. We had to really scarp out of the way. Anyway, that's another one. I like Doug Tiffany's experience. Did you read Doug's? Yes. My worst experience at sea was leaving Penang with the pickup crew heading south to Singapore. I was sleeping in the cockpit and instructed the crew to wake me up if she saw ship lights, which she did. The problem was we were in the process of being run down. The ship was passing us at about 100 feet, 100 feet ahead. I could see a person in the porthole. After collecting my wits, I asked her why she didn't call me earlier. 
turned out she was nearsighted and wasn't wearing her glasses. Oh my God. <laughs> he does go on to say that she became actually a very good crew yes. and he crewed with her for a couple of years after that. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, now again, mitigation. Uh, in that particular situation, yeah. she should have been wearing her glasses, of yeah. course. And to leave someone with <clears throat> so little experience in charge at night in a shipping lane like Singapore Straits, I think it's utter madness, personally. Uh, no, I, I disagree with that. Do you? Yeah, completely. I th because, only because, uh, as a very inexperienced crew, the first trip I did was across the English Channel. Mm. And so when the experienced skipper went to sleep, my brother and I, who had never been sailing before, were on watch. Mm. All you need to do is to say, if you see lights ahead mm. or any lights approaching, you wake the skipper up. Okay, fair enough, yeah. There were two of you and you had your glasses on. <laughs> so maybe as a skipper, you're gonna make sure your crew can see properly yes. and they understand precisely the urgency and the importance of what you're saying. I, th I think that's, that's it, exactly. And, and to make them understand, I think the general rule of thumb is 20 minutes, 15 to 20 minutes from seeing a light on the horizon to it hitting you is approximately 20 minutes, assuming that you can see six miles away and it is traveling at 15 knots. It's, right. you know, there's a general rule yeah. of thumb. You don't have much time, basically. You, you need to start making decisions fairly quickly. Yeah. Better to be a bit previous than too late. Absolutely, and do not be afraid to use the VHF. How many times have we picked up the VHF and radioed through to yeah. boats? Loads. And said to them, do you see us? Yeah. What are your intentions? Are you staying on course? And that most commercial skippers are very obliging. Yes, and sometimes it's ended up in great conversations with them. They're yeah. very interested in who we are and why we're there. It, and it's really just a matter of letting them know that you're there, yeah. politely. Number three in our top five. Uh, now, I had something else, and then you reminded me that perhaps we should include this instead. And it's basically hitting anything. Yeah. Now, this is a theme that was picked up by many people, whether it's hitting a sunken container, yes, uh, rocks, reefs, other boats. Uh, but you reminded me of, of an example in the Maldives. Oh yes, in the Maldives, which is not very well charted, uh, there are reefs everywhere, bombies everywhere, and all of the atolls. So you, you have to re rely on spotting. So you have a rough idea from the charts on, well, we had a small paper chart at the time, I seem to remember, and our basic charts on board. Um, you're spotting at the front and I was just steering, following your guide and out of nowhere where we didn't expect it, a bombie came up in front of us, didn't it? Yep, I was looking down, crystal yeah. clear waters, yeah. admiring the seabed which was 10 meters down. Yeah. Next thing I know I can see coral this far away from when me, so, so close that uh, I could see the eyeballs of fish swimming around yeah. and I just turn around and screamed, astern, astern. I slammed it. it. We weren't going fast. I mean, that is something to, to, to say, you know, if you're doing this kind of thing, don't go fast. So I was able to turn just, you reckon about two meters from the It, it was so close. Yeah. It was so close. But uh, yeah, I mean, hitting anything, I mean, especially where we are, where we've got so many reefs. Yeah. And of course, this is where we quite often rely on satellite imagery now, nowadays. It really, really helps. It's yeah. amazing how clear those satellite images are, although they don't always get it right. We were um, travelling from Bellaton north up to towards Singapore through an area and we took a shortcut through some islands and uh, a similar thing happened, didn't it? Yes, I'm glad you reminded me mm. of that because that was one of our worst experiences. Mm. And by the way, when you say a shortcut, it wasn't a shortcut. It was the... because that makes it sound like we were trying to you know, shave the corners off a, a, a passage and we weren't. This was a recognised passage because yes. we had just passed a ferry. Yes. And uh, on the charts it said a uh, shallow patch of 10 metres. Mm. And we were using satellite images and I could see there was a, you know, a shallower patch on the satellite mm. image as well. And we were, this was in the, literally in the middle of nowhere, yeah. uh, except um, a few islands with no one on them. That ferry was travelling between two big cities, yeah. uh, so we were probably 50 miles from the closest town. Oh, there would have been no help, maybe a fishing boat. And as we approached this shallow patch, it went from 20 metres, jumped to 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, and it got down to 2 metres. I mean, obviously, by the time we'd got to 5 metres, I'd slam the boat into a stern. 
but the worrying thing is, is that if we had have hit that yeah. and t t taken on water, there was no one to help yeah. us. Uh, we also had just come through a cut with a huge, huge current, so it wasn't easy to, to get out or to get in there. You had to get it right. So that there was that worry. And I think you were looking at Google and I was looking at Bing. And when we looked at my, Google, my image, it was much clearer than it was on yours. So satellite's great, but you need to have lots of options, even if you're using satellite, don't you? We learned that. Yeah. So we now have various options available on our phones so that we can swap between them because some places are clearer on one than the other. Well, that was definitely the closest we ever came to running aground. Mm. And that put the willies up me for, mm. for months now. And even when I think about it now, it does scare me. And as I say, the, the big problem there would have been you had no help. We had no phone signal. There was no one around. Uh, we would have ended up on the little atoll that that reef was next to. Probably would have had to wait it for the next ferry to go past, yeah. you know, next week or whenever it was. I reckon some Indonesians would have come out of the woodwork and found us because they are everywhere. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so that was one of those stomach churning, butt clenching moments. We've had a few of those. Yes. Did you have anything else for things that you can hit? The, the, the container thing, I put that in because of that film. All is lost. All is lost. Yeah, when Robert Redford, film. Yeah, Robert Redford hits a container. But I also put it in because it used to be one of my biggest fears early on when I discovered that this was a thing, that containers get lost and they hang around in the ocean, sometimes in big, fierce waves, uh, being pummeled around the sea and they can cause huge, well, they can bring down a yacht very easily. When I discovered this very early on, I spent a year being terrified of t containers. So how do you get over that fear? You can't. Yeah. You can't. And uh, just before we left uh, Saba, there was a ship, I think it had left Japan, and it had lost, in a typhoon, had lost over 200 containers. Mm. Well, they're still out there yeah. floating around. And who's to say they're not floating this way? I mean, it, it's still a concern of mine. It is a concern. But well, we can talk about this generally later, but you have to kind of park them, don't you? You have, to, you have to park concerns like that. There's nothing you can do about it except keep watch. And just be prepared. Yeah. You know, know what to do were something to happen. Yeah. At number two, uh, now, I'm not entirely sure how this fits in with what anyone else has suggested, but this was one of the most terrifying moments for me personally. And that was when we hit the Bermuda Triangle in the Indian Ocean. Uh, we were trying to cross between two uh, islands, two atolls, I think we were close to the equator in the Maldives. And uh, we got an, almost a knockdown in a squall. Well, we did. I mean, we had water coming into the cockpit. We had... My feet. Yes, I remember the solar panels, and these were the smaller solar panels we had uh, mounted upright at the back of the boat. I remember looking down and they were actually slicing through the water. And for those to be in the water, yeah. uh, Esper would have been healed over. Yeah. So just to let everyone know, it was a nice gentle breeze evening sail. And it was lovely. We didn't have, the, we didn't have everything right out. But we had the mizzen, you were standing on the, by the mizzen mast behind me and I was steering. And lovely, gentle evening, warm breeze and then bang, literally bang, 35 knots, bang, and that knocked us over. Luckily you were standing on the side of the mizzen that when we went, you went with it, so you weren't hanging off it, you were holding onto it. Um, and I was holding onto the wheel, we weren't tethered, you know, really bad. Um, managed to steer the boat round into, into the wind so that it, it took the wind out of the sails and got the boat upright. upright. That was the beginning of a three-day terrible ordeal, wasn't it? Yeah, so what happened was this was the beginning of the southwest monsoon. And we, for the rest of that journey, we just had squall after squall after squall. And of course, we'd thought previously, well, squalls, they come, they, go, they pass quickly, and then you've got 24 hours of clear weather again. This was a gale, it wasn't a squall. It, it, ju it just, it was constant. But the most terrifying thing was this. We couldn't make way in the direction we wanted to go. 
So uh, and we've, we've mentioned this before, we ended up actually being pushed towards Australia. That was the, the our only option was actually Australia from the Maldives. Yeah, to go across the equator, having not checked yeah. out. We thought, well, we just have to go where the weather's telling us to go. Yeah, and eventually we managed, I think what we did was we then headed due north uh, and I just put the engine into full revs and yeah. absolutely thrashed the engine just to try and make some way. But the terrifying thing was, after 24 hours, I looked at the chart plotter and we were back in exactly the same position we had been in 24 hours earlier. So we'd done this triangle. And this goes back to the whole mitigation idea. You know, what could we have done to got out of this situation? We couldn't. We had no control over the weather and very little control about the, the way that we were moving uh, with the weather. I do wonder whether that weather was available to us but we didn't have the apps and the, and the availability that we have now. We didn't have predict wind. I don't think we checked predict wind. We were just doing nice little sails through the atolls not expecting anything big. So I think that that was our fault because we didn't know the weather was there. Oh, uh, without a doubt, yeah, yeah. Um, but that, yeah, it was just horrible. I actually had a mini breakdown, I think. Yeah. It, 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 it was just so terrifying not yeah. having this, any control over the situation. Now, this isn't life-threatening because, of course, you're still floating on the boat, you've got provisions. Yeah. You know, we would have happily have just bobbed along to Australia. I did nearly knock myself out down below because oh, it was so uh, rough and um, came up crying. In fact, we had moments where I was strong for you and moments you were strong for me and at the end of it we managed to get back to Mali after three days which is the capital of um, the Maldives. We had built up a lot of faith in each other's stamina and ability didn't we because we had to take it in turns to watch. We didn't really sleep at all when when you weren't on watch you were lying down in the cockpit so that you could just jump up at a moment and I don't think we ate anything. Except tin tuna. We ate tin tuna. We also did that across, but that's another story. I mean, it was physically mm. exhausting. Yeah. Uh, and I think that was the other thing, was just this feeling of when is this going to end? Yeah. My body can't take much more, but your body does. You know, the adrenaline yeah. just keeps pumping yeah. through you and you just cope with those situations. But that feeling of having no control, yeah. that was for me the most terrifying thing, yeah, was that, that just losing control of the situation. Yes. I was all right about that. I think that's why I was able to help you through that because I just said to myself, well, if we have to go across the equator and we have to go to Australia, we go to Australia. Well, I knew we had plenty of provisions. I knew it could be done. So I didn't mind the, the lack of control because it was beyond our control. So I just let it go. I'm a bit more fatalistic, I think. At number one. Yes. And this is not only my top number one but I think quite a few people there I can't remember if it's in our top five yes I think only a few people have mentioned this and that's illness right so you've put this as number one but it's not happened to us well, it's your biggest fear let me just explain yeah go on then this went to my number one only the other day Sorry for interrupting, but while I've got you here, if you like what we do and you want to support us and become a Patreon, or join us on FTB Mates, or even drop a quid in the rum fund, go to followtheboat.com forward slash pub. Of course, come to the pub. I'm not going to bore people with my medical ailments, but I have a prolapsed disc, and very occasionally I have muscle spasms in my back. Now, to anyone who hasn't experienced this, it is the single most excruciating, painful thing I've ever experienced. And I think for a man, I've got a pretty high pain threshold. Mm, yes. When these muscle spasms happen, it can, not only is it excruciatingly painful, uh, it completely incapacitates me uh, for hours and hours. And it's exhausting and it's very horrible. And unfortunately, I had an attack the other day now, the reason why I put this at number one was because a few things went through my mind. The first thing was is that it felt like it was actually uh, some kind of kidney infection. But the other thing that kept racing through my mind was maybe my appendix has burst. Yeah. And this brings me immediately on to Wilfred Dahr's comment, yeah. who said, my biggest fear is this. Both my brother and I had appendicitis, appendicitis in our youth. In my case, it's, I started to feel ill Friday night. Saturday was pretty rough. 
We thought it was the flu. By Sunday night, I had a terrible stomach ache, but by Monday morning, I was feeling a little better because, unbeknownst to us, it had ruptured. Went in to see our family doc, and on examining me at his office, he cleared his day and met me at the hospital for the emergency surgery. I had sepsis by this point and almost died. Had I been on the boat, it would have been game over. Yes. Now, this was what was running through my mind was maybe this is appendicitis. Now, on top of all this, I should add, where we are currently anchored, we are a good mile and a half away from the town centre. The dinghy is hanging up on the back of the boat. I was completely incapacitated and unable to do anything. And I was also aware that the, uh, the fuel can was empty. There was no fuel in the dinghy to have got us ashore. So if in that emergency I needed you to get me ashore, you would have really struggled. I would have struggled, yes. Uh, we did it with you directing me on all the things to do. I could do it again. Mitigating circumstances here as we're in a nice anchorage with even two boats here we know and we've got people as you might be able to hear going past all the time so we could always flag down someone to help us here but I totally agree that out in the ocean you are alone. Uh, Michael Tillman said when you're days away from shore and the entire crew is down do you really want to call for rescue and abandon the boat? I suspect that health may be more likely than any of the others to be the biggest problem, even piracy. And I agree, what can, you know, someone has a heart attack, well, you can, you can carry defibrillators, we've talked about that, but those kind of, that, that burst appendix and things like that has crossed my mind many times. Um, there's nothing you can do about that. You have to make the decision, you have to analyse the risk and decide if you're prepared to, for it to happen to you or not. Because, you know, there's no, uh, warning signs it, yeah. and, and these illnesses and health issues can happen to the healthiest of people yeah. so it's not even like well you mitigate this by staying healthy yeah. um, and uh, yeah it's it's a really big concern yeah right? I mean for, uh, we have said that next time we do a proper ocean passage where we're going to be away for weeks or over a week ten days or more we will take a full first aid kit do you agree or maybe you disagree Leave a comment for us on Twitter at Follow the Boat. You did that list, and I kind of agree with you, but there were other things that I had on my list. We've done my biggest fear, which is getting run down, but the things that have happened to us that have really worried me, um, so Man Overboard came top on the poll. Everybody worries about Man Overboard. Lots of things to say about that. It hasn't happened to us, but we've had the second worst thing, which is Cat Overboard. We lost Millie at anchor uh, in a huge anchorage in Langkawi. Uh, we, we've talked about this in the past, there's a whole video on it, and it was the single most terrifying, upsetting thing that's ever happened to me on the boat, was losing Millie overboard. Now, yeah. losing your partner, family, another human, I can't imagine, and it has happened, and it does happen, two cruisers. So it is a very realistic uh, fear, I think. Um, everyone will be glad to know that we found Millie, but by luck, so that would be on my list. And there, there are a few, you know, there were a few things said about Man Overboard. Um, lots of people said it. Um, SVZ, I thought this was good. Before doing ocean passages, it was capsizing or pitch poling. But after a fair few passages and a couple of knockdowns, it is now by far Man Overboard. I'd agree with that, would you? Yes. Now I think this, again, this goes back to mitigation. You do what you can to prevent it happening in the first place. Yeah. Clipping on at night, clipping yeah. on in bad weather, making sure you have your PLB, your EPIRB yeah. uh, fully charged, uh, good communications in case anything were to happen. Um, but of course, sometimes... You can so, do all of that and so, it can still go wrong. Exactly. As yes. it did for our friend Nigel, and we, and we talked about this in a two-parter, I fell off my boat. He had done everything right but he still went overboard. And if you think that that's not going to happen to you, then you need to watch this. Well, now there was one quote someone came up with towards the end. Who... Yes, so somebody, Wilfred, said, Man overboards are too easy to avoid. Clip on, don't pee over the side, done. Funny that it's the greatest concern for so many people. I think e easy to say yes. uh, when you're sitting comfortably either on your sofa or behind your helm in calm weather. Yeah. 
Uh, but I think it's very different when you're in these horrendous situations like Nigel was. Yes. And he did everything. And he was, yes. and actually, part of his problem was he was clipped yes. on. Yes. So you need to watch episode 260, and I'll link to this at the end of the video, and I'll put it in the comments, yeah. in the description, sorry. Uh, another one uh, was lightning. Mm. And this was a fear of mine. It almost entered into my top five because, again, this is something you have no control over. And we have been through some horrendous lightning storms. Uh, don't forget, Singapore, I think, along with Florida, Florida is the most struck place in the world for lightning strikes. It's interesting because the people that commented, or some of them said it's because they're in the tropics. One, one guy, uh, Lawrence, uh, in Mexico, uh, these people all seem to be in areas where lightning features a lot. So I guess if you're somewhere it's, where it's not so bad, it's less of a fear. I suppose so, yeah. I mean, we have been through, we've done passages where we've just gone through lightning storm after lightning yeah. storm. And uh, as you reminded me earlier, we could actually see forks of lightning oh, yes. hitting the sea only you know, a couple of miles away, yeah. or it certainly felt like it was only a couple of miles away. And how do you get over that? It's one of those things that you can't do anything about, isn't it? The only thing we do is turn the engine on, isn't it? Yes. Uh, because if you get a lightning strike and you're fortunate that it doesn't blow a, you know, a hole through your hull or it doesn't hit you, it can disable your uh, electrics and uh, it can melt your starter motor as well, among many other things it can do. So yeah. one of the preventative things is we do is to turn the engine on. So if we get hit, we still have the engine yeah. running uh, yeah. yes, to get us out of situation. I mean, we were hit by lightning in India. We were in the marina and it wasn't a direct hit. We got one of the, you know, I don't know what they're called, but it certainly got our mast and took out the radar and a few other things. We basically yeah. finished off our whole B&G system, didn't it? Yeah. So um, all I would say about lightning is it's a bit like your thing earlier about us not being able to go anywhere. But for me, there's nothing I can do about it, so I'm not going to worry about it. There's, there's nothing, literally nothing one can do. And if you're going to worry that it might happen to you, then you probably shouldn't be on a boat because there are so many risks of, of being on a boat that worrying about the things you have no control over is pointless. I mean, the only thing we have tried to do is to monitor squalls on the radar. Yes. And Storm dodging. Yes, and invariably when you turn to starboard to... <laughs> Uh, to avoid the school that appears to be moving in the opposite direction, it's yeah. not. What's happening is it's actually building and spreading. Yeah. So yes, very, very difficult to, to mitigate that. I do have to add though, that when we've been in some bad ones, it does put the fear of God in me. When you hear those, and you can smell it, and you, yeah. and you, and, you know, it's that close. It is terrifying, no doubt about it. But I only worry about it when it's actually happening. Correct. The other thing I wanted to mention uh, is the engine cutting out. Yeah. Now, again, thinking of mitigation, in most circumstances you can avoid this happening or you do your best to avoid it happening, but it does happen and it happened to us very recently, uh, yet to be discussed in our vlogs, but uh, we will talk about that a bit more. And the when your engine cuts out, it will invariably cut out uh, at the worst moment. Absolutely, and it has done. Jane, on Patreon, she put this, the biggest of the biggest fears for me is losing my engine, especially when close to land. I fear it because of the much higher chance of it happening when compared to something like man overboard. This is despite all of the checks and preventative measures I regularly perform to keep the system operating smoothly. I think Jane, she sums up perfectly my whole thinking behind worst things that happen at sea, and that is, the things that potentially can happen every single day you're traveling mm. versus worst case scenarios which are unlikely to happen, mm. one hopes, like man overboard. The engine cutting out, the anchor dragging, hitting rocks and reefs, these are daily hazards and fears that yes. I have yes. on a daily basis. Yes. And the thing about those is that you can do things to prevent it by good seamanship and by being alert as much as you can, yes. Which is why sailing is so tiring. People wonder why, oh, you've had a lovely sail. Yes, but you've spent the whole time trying to make sure that no disasters occur. It's a huge part of it. So you're running on adrenaline a great deal of the time, I'd say. 
We should just give an honourable mention as well to Fire, mm. because this did come up in your top five uh, from our poll. Yeah. And uh, it's something that we do need to stay on top of, be aware of and be prepared for. Yeah. Uh, Travelling Wilbury said, Fire, saw my first boat fire in the marina only this week. It's terrifying how quickly fire can take hold and how it's near impossible to extinguish. And Tuvia, who frequently comments, and by the way, Tuvia, thank you for your personal email you sent the other day. It was nice mm -hmm. to hear from you. He says, as a former member of the US Coast Guard and having been on search and rescue missions, I would say first is a fire mm -hmm. of worst things that can happen. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, you carry all the necessary fire extinguishers and you do your best to avoid those situations, but fire can be caused by many things you may overlook, including that lightning strike. Mm -hmm. Two more things I want to say before we finish. First of all, the none slash all comments. So under the poll, we had all of the above, none of the above, all of the above, nothing of these. I've sailed with my big brother and sister, so no fears here. And finally, from Pamela Graham Baldwin, nothing, cruised for 11 years. What's your answer to that? <laughs> I don't want to make it personal, but I find I've come across this attitude before mm. someone we know and I said uh, I asked them about uh, what what they what do they want to learn about sailing and their response was I know everything mm. I've been sailing for so long I, I there's nothing more for me to learn I find that attitude curious I find it shocking to have no fear and not to want to learn anything we've been cruising for 16 years and yet I still have fears okay they're they're, they're well contained but they are real fears and they keep me on top of the game and they keep the adrenaline working for me. I would say moreover that you I think I have more fears now than when I first yes. started because as you, as you learn more about the things that can go wrong mm. uh, so you're much more aware of them yes. um, and uh, they're always forefront of your mind you know when when your engine has cut out a few times when you've come close to uh, hitting a, a reef, uh, you're much more conscious of these potential problems when you go out sailing. So, um, yeah, to, to have no fear of these situations. I don't think that's healthy. I don't think it's right, and I probably wouldn't want to sail with someone who, who is that cocky. Yeah. I'll be honest with you. Yeah. Um, right, so we've gone through all of our things that have actually happened to us, the things that frighten us, and I just want to say I've got one or two more and that's it, and then we'll finish this podcast. So this, in no particular order, was said in response to the poll. Bumping into vloggers. <laughs> God forbid. Having to get out and push. Running out of gin, running out of chocolate, running out of rum, running out of baked beans, running out of coffee. And somebody said, meeting Canadians. Oh dear. How rude. Terrible. I like Canadians. Running out of coffee. Oh. That's, uh, that never happens on our boat. <laughs> it's we not have, allowed to happen. We have so many coffee beans stashed away all over the boat. It yeah. cannot happen. And we are in a country that is famous for its it coffee is. production. Yeah. Okay, well, that's it for this week. It was a long one. I'm sorry about that. But we felt it was important. We've tried to cover off what we can. And now, Jamie, take it away. What are you doing today? Well, I th I'm wondering whether we should actually think about re-anchoring over on the other side of the bay because tomorrow we, on someone's special day, are going to go...